Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Quick Fix Fantasy. I am Chris P, and as always, I am joined by Dr. Doug Leiby. What is up, Dr. Doug? How is it going? I am I am good. Uh, a long work week this week, but I had a very successful uh, betting week last weekend, and so I'm 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 riding the high right now. Excited to get into these games, talk about it talk about the process i don't know i'm just on a i'm on a general cod high right now where it's just like everything's great or whatever how are you feeling i'm feeling good you know end of the season too so you know uh over here the you know the stakes are a lot higher uh but we have like two weeks worth of matches left uh like one week and then we have the toronto major and then we have a week or two weeks off and then the major so we don't really have too much call of duty left this year Oh, wow. It's only two weeks between the last major and champs. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Like, what was it? In World War II, it was like over a month or something. I just remember. Yeah. It's like it was a really long break. But yeah, um, it's going to be it's going to be crazy here for the next couple of weeks. Um, are you are you do you like the idea that like it's going to be so long between champs and when the next game comes back? Or do you wish that they had like stretched it out or you think they should have waited longer to start this season? Like, or do you like the format? I mean, I think there's a fine line on too long and not long enough. I think you do have to give these guys an off season to be able to, you know, decompress a little bit because the hours are long. I know for a lot of people, they're like, oh, they play video games for a living. Like, how tough can that be? Their days are brutal. Uh, they are in that facility for like 10 hours a day, scrimming, going over VOD every day. Like, there's no days off. Uh, yeah. So they definitely need some time off. And I mean, when a game ends, you know, there's not really much to do on that game until the new one comes out anyway. You're not going to, you know, try to get better at MW2 knowing that the next title's coming out. There's just no point. Um, unless you want to stay, you know, having fun in like GBs or, you know, these pickup tournaments. But, you know, from these professionals, it's it's fine. But I miss the guys at the facility, like when the team isn't there. Um, yeah, it's like, uh, like when I, I lived when my wife was still in college and like we lived in the college town, it's like the time after, after graduation. And there's like, you go to the store and there's nobody there. And you're like, where'd all the kids go? Like yeah. <laughs> everybody's gone. But, uh, no, yeah, I'm a big proponent or like, I, I've, I've been a big, uh, I've been, I've enjoyed the schedule this year. I think like getting the games going sooner after the game releases, we can grab onto more of that hype. And like, I, I see some people say, okay, well give us another major to like, yeah, just give it a little more length. Like we used to end in August and stuff. And now we're going to end so much earlier, but like, I know the game gets old after a while. Like you can see it in the viewership and like, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like we're on a kind of a sweet spot right here. Um, where like, the game is fresh when it starts and it's not stale by the time it ends. And like, I think the hype for the next game, like with a longer break will be even bigger. Like, yeah, people get a break and then, yeah, we come back and the new game drops and everybody's just going to be so hype. Yeah. It's like a double-edged sword with the yearly releases. Like it has the lifespan to still be interesting at the tail end of it too. But like, if you don't enjoy it, it's okay. Just wait a couple months. Like we'll have a new one for you. And like, it kind of keeps the scene fresh. But also makes things <coughs> a little difficult for the, you know, for the players. You got to learn a whole new game in a couple months after you're like just getting your footing. But it is what it is. But you know, looking forward to the next one as we are every year. But I know everyone listening really cares about you know how we feel. But you guys care about you know how, how we're doing, how Doug is doing in his lineups, which you know he said he's riding this high. But I think there's a little pot that's hurting inside of him, and he'll get into it. But Doug, you know uh, what happened? What'd you play last week? How'd everything go? Uh, the answer to what I played last week was poorly against Doug Sensor Martin. Uh, I yes, he beat me. It was a close game. Um, surprisingly, I feel like I I got lucky and held my own against him. He picked an insane lineup for Sunday on like five days in advance too, which is more impressive. He did no research before. He did his research like the week before. I think so. He um, for anybody that listening that's not aware, we we both picked DraftKings lineups for Sunday's DraftKings slate. He picked his on Wednesday or Thursday um, in advance, so he didn't even know about the games going into that. But uh, Basically, I'd say it came down to he picked Temp in that, um, and which was like he picked Temp and Clay. So he's making a strong read that Vegas was going to be very competitive in their game against Minnesota and that he really liked them. And like, I, I tended to agree that Vegas was probably a bit stronger, but he went all the way. And I mean, obviously, Temp had what, like a hundred and a uh, 117 fantasy points for someone who hasn't even put up half that in most games so like i mean props to him i i was not mad to get beaten when i did the numbers out and i saw how many points he scored i think yeah he scored 
561 points. Um, that's a that's a pretty good score for just a lineup that he came up with, um, just based on like the attributes of the players more so than anything. So I'm not mad. I scored 545, but and I thought, yeah, when I first looked, I was like, oh man, my lineup is great. And then when I started doing the numbers on his, I'm like, wow. Props to him though. Uh, Dougie baby, this week. you know he just, he just knows he's in the field. You know you're behind the computer. He's in the field. I mean, yeah, that. I mean, yeah, I, I really would attribute that temp call to like he. Yeah, I mean, he sees something in that game that I'm not looking at. Because yeah, I'm not. Temp was not really ever in consideration for me. Fairly highly priced, like in a matchup that like. Although I thought Vegas was favorite, I didn't think it was a. It was about to be a temp masterclass or anything. So yeah, I know. I'll I'll give him credit where credits due there. That like. That's a read that a, a guy who mostly looks at that data is not making very often, I don't think. So yeah. <laughs> it, it'd be one thing if I just got beat on some fluke, like, oh, like, yeah, whatever. Like, we picked mostly the same players and his were a little bit. But, like, I think, yeah, he, he made a good read and, and it paid off for him. So A good read, yeah. Just throw did, I hide, did I hide my sorrow well there or did do we need to do another take? No, no, I, I, I think you're fine. <laughs> you, pl- you played it off like a true professional. I could tell deep down you, uh, you know, you're very upset, but... You know, it's the way it goes. You win, you lose. You know, some people throw a, a dot at a dot board to pick players and beat someone that, you know, spends all this time crunching the numbers. And, you know, it happens. You know, it keeps you humble. It keeps you on your toes. Um, but you were you were saying earlier that, you know, you had your DraftKings lineup, but is it true that you played mostly prize picks this weekend? Yes, I was playing mostly prize picks this weekend. Um, I just, I think the prize picks, it takes a little bit of time. And, like, I, the thing I like about prize picks is that, like, because the lines evolve like as the maps come out and stuff it's something that i can do while i'm watching the games like i'm already going to sit here and watch the games every day anyway so like while i'm sat here doing that i i can run the prize picks where like DraftKings, you have to get it all in before the matches start and so like i found myself gravitating this weekend towards prize picks just because of my schedule more but i also feel like prize picks just in my experience the last few weeks with prize picks on cod like there's a lot of value to be had on prize picks. And so I, yeah, I, I've, I've made a couple of points today that we'll maybe go through, but yeah, I found myself this weekend playing mostly prize picks and had yeah a really good weekend. I was very happy with my play in general, just like um, my uh, patience or like ability to not just pick players in every game or something like that. And like, and just like the, the picks that I was making, I felt were sharp. Even in the ones that I missed, I felt like I felt like I made a pretty good call. Um, obviously, the uh, what was it? London against Lag on Friday. That that uh, Expo control that went five rounds after London was up 2-0. Um, I had the unders on the on Arsides and and scraps or something like that. And like watching that game evolve from like both of them having like ten less kills than their totals and then go all the go all the way to five rounds after rcd c9s them on the point uh, that was pretty painful but i felt like i made a good read because i feel like in 99 percent of cases that game should have been over 3-0 and i would have been cashing a check but instead i watched that game go to five and which was pretty painful but that was one of the few like stingers but like i felt like i had a good read on the game i mean that game was that game that game could have been over in like eight minutes total. So uh, I felt pretty good. It could have. And you raised a good point. So usually, Doug, you're the one that, you know, gives these little tidbits of advice for the people that are listening. But I want to say something really quick from my end because you raised a good point that I am a culprit of as well. You don't have to bet on everything. I know, like, it sounds fun to bet on every single game. But, like, don't go chasing things that aren't there. Especially if you lose one, you're like, okay, I have to make it on the – I have to make it back on the next one. That – is the epitome of not gambling responsibly. In my opinion, don't chase your losses. Bet with a meaning behind it. And don't just try to make up your losses by betting on something that you truly don't believe in or did your research on. Uh, That is something I've learned the hard way. So for people that are listening, don't always feel like you have to chase the next game just because it's on and just because you want something to do. Yeah, I would say like to that point, like one of the things that I found myself thinking about a lot this weekend is like... um, learning the maps is good and like i do think that like people who who tout the fact that like yeah you want to know the maps before you make your picks like i think that's a smart move in general but i also do think and i found that like especially in hard point where like the map pick has a really big impact on the kill totals for everyone like prize picks is relatively i wouldn't say efficient but they are very quick to move the lines and so like if you are find yourself like after the maps have already been released 
and like you like you can probably assume if it's been more than five minutes since the lines that the maps have been released like the lines have moved some um in response to either betting or also just like the the news like there's a pretty good chance, especially in Hardpoint, that there aren't going to be any, like, juicy lines left out there. And so, like, I think, especially this cycle that I think people get into, which is, like, you bet a game and or bet a map, and then it doesn't turn out the way you want, so you turn to the next map. Like, all the information's already been out there. Like, just be, the only new information is that you lost, and that doesn't, that doesn't change the totals any. So, like, I do think that, like, while it is nice to try to, like, snipe lines right when the, li when the maps come out, like, if you're waiting to the last possible moment to make your bets, you're probably just betting into stale lines or sorry, betting into sharper lines because yeah, like things have moved around at that point. Like I think like the two times to make bets are well in advance and right after maps come out. And I think those are probably like the only two good times to make bets. And so like, if you find yourself just making bets at not those two times, you probably want to reevaluate like, why am I even making this bet? Like, do I really think this was good value? Because if it is good value, was it good, was it even better value before? Like, and if so, like, are you just chasing the value now and it might not be there anymore? Like, so like, I would say that my bets are split pretty evenly between actually probably 75, 25 to I'm betting before the maps even come out in spots where I feel either I think the line is inefficient regardless of the map um, and I'm looking at all the potential maps and seeing that or like I have a read on what the map might be or something I'm a little shaky on how easy it is to predict the map but like I found especially in control I found situations where regardless of the control map the kill environment which is something we talked about last week is just like how much like does the how favored a team is affects how many kills they get but then also like the map itself it will give you more or less kills like even regardless of the map there are certain situations in control or i found lines that i'd have been happy regardless of what map it came out as and then to wrap it up i'd say in search like we've talked about it the maps are pretty unimportant you have to get the same amount of kills to win a round on uh, lsc low as you do on uh, embassy or whatever it's the same so like in general there may be a little bit of like play style difference in search if, for certain maps but like in general i'm happy to bet search and some control well in advance of the maps hard point is like hard point it's tough like if you if you bet the over in a hard point and then you find hydro come in at the last minute like what it, you, you did everything you could or whatever so like it sometimes does pay to wait on those because yeah a, a rogue hydro or a rogue fortress hard point will just destroy a slip if you're not careful yeah, and it's, you know, sometimes you could see the maps just like you could predict what maps are going to be played. But, you know, on any given day, someone could be practicing something totally different and you don't know what a team's going to veto, how they were looking in scrims. You're not in those rooms, so you can't really predict that. But one thing that you can try to predict, I would say, is like kills in prior maps. Uh, so uh, do you want to give a little mini lesson on, you know, how to properly read, you know, prior games? Yeah. So this is this was what I wanted to be like our our like sort of mini thought lesson for the day is just like I I see this a lot and so like uh, I'll admit like I, I listen to the flank a decent amount during the maps and like uh like Tommy Zuma and Ben like they've been getting more into the prize picks and this is something I hear them talk about a lot so I'll just like I, I don't know what everyone's process listening is but like I I like to think of their process as like the everyday man's process to betting prize picks or whatever and so like something that they do and it like makes sense is like okay you have you have an over under total that you have for a game and you want to know which side to bet on you just look at the player's previous performance and i think that's a really i mean like that's that the one of the best predictors of their future performance should be their past performance to a degree and so i think like the important thing here is like what should you be looking at when you look at the past performance that might help you get a more refined take so like i can look at uh, so I've written out an example here, but like, um, so to, so for tomorrow's games, Scraps, uh, London against Florida tomorrow, he's over under 20 and a half kills map one versus Florida. Um, so I, there's a the number. Do I want to go above 20 and a half or below? I can look at his last few games, 33, 27, 24, uh, 23, 30, and 20. So he's been below 20 and a half once out of the last five games. Um, but how much does that really tell me? Like, so then I look at one of those specific maps. So a map he went 24 and 17 on against Texas on hydro hard point. Um, and then they also lost that game by 54 points. So like that is some additional information I have. He, he had 24 kills, but it was on hydro and they lost by 
almost a full hill. So what does that tell me? Uh, what additional information do I have other than just that he has 24 kills in that game? Well, I know Hydro is slow. So if that game had not been played on Hydro, he probably would have gotten more kills. So like my estimate of about how many more kills you get for it being Hydro is about one and a half additional kills. So he got 24 and they lost by a big amount, but they played Hydro. If they had played Embassy instead, I'd expect 25 and a half kills instead of 24. That's good information to have because yeah, like if, if we don't know if they're going to play Hydro or not. And so doing that little math there can help a little. The other thing is how much you lose by. So in this game against Florida uh, tomorrow, Scraps and London are 27 and a half point underdogs in the hard point. So they're, they're like the odds on thing that will happen is that they'll lose by 27 and a half on average. So that's a lot less than 54 points, which is what they lost to Optic Texas in this Hydro hard point in our example. So like to just say, oh, he scored, he gets 24 kills on average. Well, on average, when they lose by 56 points, but they're not going to lose by 56 points. At least the bookmakers don't think they are. They're going to lose by less. And so that I give him a little bit of a bump for that, too. If the game is closer, game goes longer, they might he might be able to get more kills. So basically, I'm looking at that 24 and going, you know, that 24 is more like 27 in like a an average game. And so like that's that's sort of how I'm reading uh, past game results. And like, I think that's something that people can take um, and apply to other modes as well. Um, and like, cause those are the two big things to me is the map. And then also like the, the score environment, like how much did they win or lose by? Yeah. When they were playing Texas, London was not favored and he still managed to get 24. Now they're playing Florida. But if I just looked at it and said, Oh, he scored 24 kills. That's, that's a bit more than his over under is right now. I should bet the over you're not taking all the information that you can from that game line. And so, yeah, when I'm scrolling through the game lines, I'm looking at, what was the context like? Like, yeah, I, I'm much more interested in Scraps game lines and games against other bad teams when he's going to play Florida tomorrow. Like I see against Lag in Minnesota, they played back to back uh, two hard points in each against Minnesota and Lag. And he went over 20 and a half, three out of those four games. And so like that makes me a bit more confident because those are games where surely he was coming in in a very similar position to this one against Florida, where there might be underdogs because London is not very good, but only slight underdogs because Florida is also not very good. Um, so yeah, to me, I, I think that the over still makes a lot of sense here. Um, but I just wanted to point out how, like, maybe just looking at the past game, like, oh, he scored 33 last game, bet the over is like not giving you the whole story. I agree with that. You know, you got to read the whole book. Can't read, can't read the front page. You got to read the whole book, you know, cause if yes. not, you don't know the full story. I just came up with that one off the top of my head. I'm a fucking brain box. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I feel like the, uh, the, I, we've talked about this before on the podcast, but just like the idea that the average of all their stats is like reflective of how they do against an average team, but you don't play average teams. You play one team like Florida is not a league average team. So even though London is pretty bad and like they might, yeah, like, but on average, they still have to play a team better than Florida, even though they're bad. And like that is that weighs into decisions here. Um, and yeah, you should be able to do that looking back at the game logs. Absolutely. Uh, so let's dive into the, the weekend's games. And then, you know, uh, for the people listening, I know we mentioned Brain vs. Brian's at the end. Stay tuned till the end because we're going to get you accustomed to this. At the end, you're going to hear Dr. Doug's picks. You're going to hear Doug Sensamon, who's 1-0. and We don't have to keep talking about that, but he beat Dr. Doug last week, so he's 1-0. Mm-hmm. But we won't keep talking about it. It's fine, though. Uh, but his, his pick will be at the end as well. Uh, so I know we were just talking about London and Florida, which falls onto Friday, uh, on the Friday slate. Is there anything other than, you know, that little scraps rant that you had that sticks out to you? Yeah, I think, um, outside of just scraps, it was actually a point that I brought up last week in London versus lag, but I think sort of applies to London versus Florida too, which is like, who's the person getting the kills on London? And it turned out, I, I think I must have alluded to this on accident last week. I was saying, who's the one getting the kills? Is it going to be nasty? Is it going to be someone else? And then they ended up not even being able to beat lag. So it was, uh, maybe the question was nobody, or the answer was nobody is going to be able to get the kills against lag. But, uh, but yeah, I think that question remains here, but for Florida as well, um, capital is very expensive on the DraftKings slate for Friday. And like, uh, he averages 84, Five, yeah, 85 fantasy points a game. So it's not clear to me that that Capitals is a lock. If if Florida were to win this 3-0, that Capitals is going to be the one at the top of the scoreboard. So I do think that's something you need to take into account on this slate is like 
yeah, f like Florida drawing London is juicy, but like Capstall at 10.2K, DraftKings is aware that Florida is going to be a favorite in this game. 10.2K seems pretty crazy. Like, I think I'm willing to pay that to maybe differentiate myself a bit from the field, or I'm willing to pay that if I think that he has a really high ceiling. It's hard for me to find a really high ceiling in Capstall just because like there isn't the data to look at like in the games that Florida has been successful in is Capstall always head and shoulders above everyone else no not usually it's usually fairly even so I'm a little scared of that um, I'm a little I'm a little off put by Florida's pricing on here um, I don't think London that makes London like great value or anything but I would be cautious of that the other thing that I would point out on this slate is that Seattle New York the books have this game fairly close, not, uh, I mean, New York is a, a favorite in this game, but it's fairly close. And like, I think Pred at 9.8 is pretty good value. Um, anytime Pred is playing, like anytime they're playing tougher teams, I think Pred's ability to generate kills in tough situations shines through. Like, or I think players like Mac and Accuracy get more kills when the team does better. Pred's getting kills regardless. And so like in situations where it's tougher, Pred's gonna have even more chances to get more kills because his teammates might be dying more often. So I think Pred at 9.8 is very interesting to me in a game where they're probably underdogs, but only like, I would say like mid-range underdogs compared to Minnesota is a huge underdog against 100T, I would suspect. Despite 100T being 0-3, by the way, we didn't talk about that, but uh, yeah, it's uh, an interesting spot. Uh, Envoy 10.4K on the slate, highest priced player. Uh, we'll see if 100T can bring it back. I'm not going to be touching that, I don't think, though. Who was uh, who was it Florida that beat LAT last week? Uh, was it was. Why, why am yes, I just, it was. Yeah. Three to one, Florida on Saturday. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yes, so, I hey, I mean, if you believe, if you believe that LAT is really just uh, – whatever the opposite of the real deal is. I mean, maybe Minnesota has some value here. Um, I think how much is fame? Fame is the lowest priced player on the slate, despite averaging 10, 11 more points per game than the next, the other uh, min price player, Yuli. So that's, that's interesting to me. Uh, we have accuracy at 6.2 K as well. If we're looking at these lower price guys, priest is 6.4. All three of them, I think, are interesting. And then you have Vance at 6.6, .6, which is, again, yeah, I don't know. I, I, there's some interesting, it depends on how you read this Minnesota game. To me, I don't know. I, I, I came on here and said last week that I thought 100T was going to bounce back, not to worry too much into it. They were going to beat up on Florida, and then they lost. So maybe don't listen to me about 100T's chances. But I still find it very hard to believe that 100T is going to come in and do anything other than roll over Minnesota. I mean, um, roster change for Minnesota, though. <clears throat> Attach back in the lineup. You know, I don't believe in 110%. No one should believe in 110%, as we always say, Doug. But I, I, I think Mr. Attach has something to prove right now. I, I mean, do you get the honeymoon period if – well, I guess the lineup is still different because Fame wasn't in it when, when Attach was in it last. But I, I believe in the honeymoon buff. Like, there's something serious about that. Like, um, yeah, actually, we were – I think uh, – I'm, uh, Cheen was just talking about this on Twitter a few weeks ago or whatever, but like when he joined the LEG lineup when I was on the team and we won our first game back with him, like that's the closest I've ever seen to 110% gone in a game. Like, um, like we were like LEG was not a very strong team. And then when Cheen came in the first game that we played, like we looked like Cold War phase, like we were just unstoppable. So, uh, I, yeah, the honeymoon effect is the closest thing to 110% that I've seen given in a game. So, uh, I, be I believe that Minnesota maybe comes out with a spark, but I think on the other hand, 100T also has a spark, which is hey, we're 0 3, but we actually still have a decent chance to make winner's bracket. Um, this is a pretty serious game for them. This is not going to just be a game that they take lightly. Um, they really need to right the ship, and they still have a good reward if they do. If they go 2-0 this weekend, they're probably still in charge of their own destiny to make winner's bracket if they can do it in a convincing fashion. So, um, yeah, I'm gonna, it is what it is. I'm going to say $6,000 for fame is good value, and I'm going to tell you why. <clears throat> He's an SMG player. He played, you know, throughout majority of challenges this year as an SMG. Last year in Vanguard, played SMG. When he was on Rocket, went to AR. Now he's going back to, you know, his home role. So, might see a little uptick in the play style from uh, Mr. Fame right there. Or do you think that the switching roles will 
get in his head or well not in his head but yeah like i think switching roles can be tricky sometimes um, i think he's been a bird in a cage and they just opened up the door and now he's gonna fly they're letting him fly now so we're gonna see how that right, goes you heard it here first yep fame flying this weekend yep 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 six thousand dollars a lot of value on that i uh, mean yeah it's, it's hard to beat six thousand he could he could just walk along the ground and potentially make value at six thousand so and any player i i said this last week about uh about someone but yeah like any player that even has a chance to fly at such a low price like you you love to see that because typically guys at really low prices like they can have decent floors but they won't have decent ceilings but yeah i see fame as a person that can have some ceiling at 6k which is yeah usually you have to pay for that <laughs> true all right uh so that's the friday slate that's the big thing right there move on to saturday we got a full game we got a full day on saturday we got four nice matches going up uh we got vegas versus seattle we got florida versus texas we got lag versus toronto and atlanta phase versus boston uh what's standing out to you on saturday i think like two things that i mentioned so uh i didn't talk about it last from my my recap of last week but something that i thought was interesting last week when uh atlanta played london is like in cash games that i was playing on DraftKings a lot of people and people who ended up winning or like coming in the top 50 percent were playing three-man atlanta stacks because atlanta was just such huge favorites against them that like like you just couldn't not do it basically is what i think people came to the conclusion i feel like toronto is in a similar spot here i mean the bookmakers have them as enormous favorites over lag and like i i wonder if people will get to a similar position where it's like i just gotta play I got to play insight. I've got to play scrap. Like I've got to play scrappy for sure, but yeah, I'm going to play insight too. Um, so I'm yeah. And like, yeah, maybe reach down to Kleenex as a third or play the Toronto team slot. I'm pretty high on the Toronto team slot. I think that the way that DraftKings does pricing on teams is, I guess, interesting is a word for it, but like they just split everyone out by $200. So all the favorites are 200 apart from each other and all the dogs are 200 apart from each other. So like, because they just go up in increments of 200, if the chances of each team winning is not linearly increasing each time as well, then like there must be some value there. Like Toronto is much larger favorites against LAG than Atlanta is against Boston. Yet they're only $400 more expensive. Like I think uh, I like Toronto team slot. So I can see some people running cash with like insight scrappy or Kleenex scrappy plus the Toronto team slot. And so I, I marked this down as a game where it's like, this is a game where if Toronto does three Oh, you're just going to, your slate will be determined on if you played the Toronto guys, especially Scrappy, who can just take over a game. Like, you're going to be anybody who put Scrappy captain and Toronto in the team slot, even if they picked all $6,000 players for the rest, are just going to be walking to the bank. So, like, I see that as a pretty big trap game. I think another interesting note here Seattle versus Vegas. Um, the book, Bet365, has, as of right now, has the game as a pick 'em, so that 50 50 toss up which I think is crazy. Um, I don't I don't typically like to make like statements about just like the Vegas lines because I think the books are in general fairly efficient at this point in the season. But like, I don't have them even close to similar in strength. I think Seattle's much stronger than Vegas. Um, so I think that's something to watch out for. Seattle team uh, is the cheapest of the favorites on the slate. Um, obviously, Pred is a like always a potential play. Fourth most expensive player on the slate at 10k i feel like that's a pretty good spot i mean who knows i maybe i should channel some more doug sensor martin and suggest that like vegas is i mean like obviously this is crunch time for vegas more than anyone else so like they they're going to be playing with a chip on their shoulder but i think this is most interesting just because i think that the line seems a bit off on the game itself which could lead other people to have a skewed perception of this game like i think most people know that pred is going to be a good value still but like if you're coming at it as Pred is a pretty good value in a game that's a 50-50, that's a lot different than Pred is a good value in a game that's maybe 60-40 or something like that. Or like Seattle has legitimate chances to 3-0 here, um, which obviously adds some value to any players when you have a team that can 3-0 because you get a lot of points for 3 0 -ing. So, um, yeah, that is what the other thing on this slate that really stuck out to me is like Vegas seems to – they have Seattle as like, yeah, as I said, slight underdogs against New York and then a pick em against Vegas, which I don't know. Doesn't make sense to me. It's a little confusing. <laughs> a little confusing. And, uh, you know, with Vegas, no such thing as 110%, but they kind of need to find – they need to go 110% if it did exist. Uh, they're fighting for their champ spot, as are a lot of teams. So 
there's still a lot of, you know, big matchups. These points still mean a shit ton to a lot of these teams. Uh, and even for the teams that already clinch, you know, you got to secure your winner spots, winner's bracket, what have you. Um, and then without further ado, Sunday, 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 we got... Actually, oh, wait, what do you me, got? Oh, no, go back. Let me mention one more thing, because I think, I, I feel like I'm surprised that you didn't bring this up, but Kremp on Saturday, Boston against Atlanta, who is yet to put up less than 88 points in a game, is 6.2K. Uh, the third is, lowest, that's insane. Yeah third lowest price player on the slate despite never having put up less than 88 points which he did in the last game granted but yeah he's averaging 105 fantasy points over the games that he's played on DraftKings and is 6.2k uh i i struggle to find a reason for that so that is like something that like if at the very least you should be watching out for because other people are going to see that and play it so like kremp like if we're thinking from an ownership perspective here on DraftKings, kremp is going to be high owned uh he's going to be i saw a lot of kremp captains in cash games just because like if you put kremp captain at low price and he does anything other than score 10 points like you're going to be able to fit every other superstar on your in your lineup so like yeah, I don't know. I, I just watch out for that because if you're if we don't mention Kremp on Saturday and you go in and you can fit some superstars in and then you realize, wait, like everyone else on the slate is playing Scrappy, Dashy, Cell and Pred like it. That's why, because they're playing Kremp captain, because, yeah, why not? So I just wanted to make that one note before we go to Sunday. That is like people. Yeah, the, the Kremp train. Everyone is everyone's on board at this point that he's not going to he's not the lowest priced player on the slate but he is the lowest or like he doesn't play like that but he is so yeah it's, see uh, i'm disappointed I'm disappointed in myself not gonna lie i had it right in front of me the whole time i started seeing you know cry go on cross side for a second i was like oh my god exceed and fell at the bottom like whatever and you know there he is right there mr kremp um insider sources tell me kremp is absolutely locked in right now too so uh, Intel. yeah, Intel. That, that's what people are saying right now you know <laughs> I, I might have seen him a couple days ago but you know i'm just this is what people keep bringing back. They're like, oh my God, I hear the podcast. You guys, you're like, here's some intel. It's, it's insane. Um, all right. So, a- anything else on Saturday before I move on, Doug? I don't want to throw no, you off your game. No, okay. go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So, let me do it again. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. We got Minnesota Rocker versus Toronto Ultra, London versus LAT, and a Battle of the Northeast, Boston versus the New York Subliners. I would like to point out on that, I don't believe Boston has ever beat the New York Subliners. Or they're 0-5 against them. Some narrative juice, for sure, yeah. Um, uh, I, I think it depends. I mean, like, obviously, Boston potentially has a lot to play for here if they were to lose their game before. Um, so, like, uh, that might might play a role here. Uh, I'll just get out, jump off right to the beginning to say Kremp is 6.2 again today. So six what was he yesterday 6.2 or 6.4 yeah 6.2 against atlanta and then also 6.2 against new york so uh interesting obviously they have to price the games before any of the other games happen but like that is very interesting to me i would have expected to see him at least 6.4 today even by DraftKings logic uh where typically people playing against phase are they see them as bigger underdogs than they might actually be. But see, yeah, I, I have to, I have to ask and no shade towards, you know, DraftKings or any daily fantasy. Uh, but what is, do, you, do you have an idea for what this reasoning for this pricing could be? Is it, you know, they're considering the other SMGs that he's going to be going against. So like, obviously, you know, phase going to go against Simpa and then on um, for New York going to go against Hydra and Kismet. I can say okay. with 98% confidence that they are definitely not thinking about that. I would say the person that is making the Call of Duty salaries may have never watched Call of Duty before. Um, that might be a, a hot take. Maybe they've watched Call of Duty, but there is no shot that they are thinking about the SMG matchups that Krem's drawing into on this slate. Uh-huh. Especially, I'll say the proof here is that he's been this low against everyone, so it's not as if like this specific matchup draws a bad matchup for him or something. I do think like in general on DraftKings, like I've seen this even from back in the day in NHL and stuff like that, um, DraftKings is typically slow to react to new players that are stars. Um, it used to always be a big thing Thing. if you could like if you had insider intel on like um rookies coming up in nhl that like we're gonna get significant playtime and stuff like that that they'd sit on slates for like 
like a week before DraftKings would actually change their prices. And like you always reflect back on like the heyday where you could play a guy who's now 10K for 2.2K or whatever on DraftKings. So like I suspect this is probably more of that, which is that like DraftKings model in general for pricing heavily discounts small sample size and like because DraftKings salary makers are not sitting there watching every game like yeah we watch the games we know Kremp is a beast and like yeah these performances are semi repeatable at the very least if not like very indicative of his performance in general like DraftKings is just looking at the X number of games that he's played that they have on record and then just going from that 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 would be my hypothesis as to how the pricing works is that like he will eventually hit some like critical mass of games played where his price will reflect his average fantasy points per game. I would expect it to be soon. I would have expected it to be this week already, but um, that that's my hypothesis. I would, but I would strongly suggest that they're not thinking that, I mean, like everything else I know about DraftKings pricing would not suggest that like they're fine tuning pricing for specific matchups or anything like, yeah, they basically take the the order of the teams in terms of who's favored, and then they split them by two hundred dollars for the team slots. If they're doing that, I don't believe they're 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 measuring SMG matchup strengths. I don't know. They might be listening to the podcast, like you know, they might be onto something. They're, they're trying to. They discounted him because the people at DraftKings think Hydro is very likely map one, so they're not going to play it or something like that. Like no, I, I yeah, they've actually yeah, they've got their veto models out and their their SMG matchup gun gunfight win simulations out, and they're like, what if they yeah, do? You know, you don't know that they might. Uh Hey, I'm a betting man. I can be a betting man on here, and I bet that that's not the case. Okay, fine. I'll uh, <laughs> I, I will I'll, I'll side with you on that. It just it's a, it's a little strange to me. Um, but like I said, you know, uh, big upside to Krep as someone you know who I've watched him play. I know him personally. Kid genuinely cares. Not that that matters when it comes to this, but I think there's some meat on the bone there. And I, this is like the lower on the lower end. We've seen Awakening in a while too. Uh, he's at 9,600 right now. Usually he's at the top uh, top couple, but uh, that might just be with who he's going against that day. At the top, we have Envoy, which is number one at 10.4 in the flex position, then Scrappy 10.2 and Hydra 10,000. Yeah, I think I think this is pretty fairly priced. Um, I think Envoy in the top slot, priced on the Sunday after we get some intel on Saturday about if, yeah, I mean, if, if Minnesota comes out and beats 100T the day before, I don't think anybody's touching Envoy at 10.4 with a 10.4 foot pole or whatever. But, like, uh, it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. I, I I mean, obviously, Envoy sticks out as, like, not as intriguing to me as Scrappy and Hydra. I mean, obviously, Scrappy is in a pretty awesome matchup against Minnesota, and, like, he has the potential to drop 130 points. Um, I don't really feel the same about Envoy, maybe, but anybody can win against London, and so... Maybe that's where we're getting this price. But, like, I don't know. If I'm scrolling back through Envoy's points, 74 last game, 96 before. I guess then he drops three three digit games in a row. But he has a 48 in here. Like, I don't know. These are not 10.4 salary uh, player score lines, I think. Like, when we talk about like highest ceiling options, I see Scrappy and Hydra both as much higher ceiling options. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think. On this game specifically, I'd be very interested to see how the 100T game on Saturday goes before I make like a good call. Because yeah, if if 100T looks amazing and it's just like okay, yeah, they they had a, a bad string of luck or whatever, like yeah, maybe these guys look a little more enticing. But right now on Thursday, I sit here and they're 0 and 3. I'm like, am I really gonna pay this big of a premium for Envoy? I don't know. I wouldn't. But hey. Who am I? Um, so that's the Sunday slate. Uh, for the people listening, we are gonna we're trying something different, obviously, just going through the matches, trying to keep it short, concise, easily digestible for you guys. So obviously, if you like the way that we did things in the past, going through every game, please let us know that. Uh, if you want us to keep it high level like this, please feel free to respond to Doug, myself on Twitter. You can comment it below the video, uh, all that good stuff. But Doug, is there any uh, last pieces of golden nuggets or you know tidbits that you want to touch on before we... Uh, Stop wrapping things. No, I don't think there's anything. I'm, yeah, I'm excited to get uh, get into this weekend's games. Uh, yeah, feel free to reach out on Twitter. I'll be talking about bets and stuff uh, throughout the weekend. Try and just yeah, 
trying to do my best here. And so, yeah, be happy to answer questions. If people have feedback on the format, we're still super open. We're, we're three episodes in uh, trying to find a groove. So, yeah, if people have feedback, open to that, whatever. Oh, yeah. And I know you guys are thinking I'm going to click off the page. It's all over. No, it's not. Don't click off because after, you know, we say goodbye here, you're still going to get Doug Sensor Martin and Dr. Doug Levy's picks that they have for this week. We're going to see if Dr. Doug can even things out at one and one. We're going to see if uh, Doug Sensor Martin could go two and oh, uh, but it's going to be recurring. And if you want to keep up with the lineups that they are picking, we will now be posting, uh, posting them on our Twitter, Quick Fix Fantasy Podcast uh on twitter so go check that out shoot a follow all that good stuff but the picks will be on there we're going to start keeping tallies on you know who's winning and by how much and you know at the end maybe we'll come up with a punishment for the person that loses maybe we lock them in a diner and the only way they have to stay there for 24 hours the only way they can knock an hour off is if they ate a pancake uh maybe something like that i saw that on tiktok not my idea i think i can't take credit for that one but i thought it was hilarious i thought that i thought that was really creative because i hadn't seen it so Man, you could have just said nothing. I'd be like, wow, this I'm, guy's full of good ideas. Just like just like Doug Sensman, I'm a man of honor. You know, I, <laughs> I, I, I properly credit. That is not mine. Right, if, I knew, if I knew the original creator, I'd probably plug them right now, but I don't. Um, but yes, so please stay tuned. The picks are going to be rolling in any second. Um, I'm Chris B. This is Dr. Doug Levy. And thank you for tuning in to Quick Kicks Fantasy. We'll see you on the next one. All right, guys, for my captain this week, I'm picking Celium. And for my four players, I'm picking Scrap. Shotzi, Sib, and Kremp, and the team I'm picking is Boston Breach. What's up, guys? Dr. Doug back. Gonna go through my lineup for Brains versus Braun here against Doug Sensor Martin. I'm down 0 1, so looking to make a recovery this week. Uh, so on the Sunday slate, we've got New York against Boston, Toronto, Minnesota, and 100T against London. There's two big favorites on the slate in 100T and Toronto, but 100T has yet to prove themselves this split. Um, they're 0-3 right now, and it's kind of hard to know what they're going to be doing this weekend. Uh, I still like them as big favorites, but I think Toronto is definitely the safest play. So to start my team off, I wanted to build around scrappy Kleenex and then playing Toronto in the team slot. I think Toronto's chance to 3-0 um, is really strong for just 3.6k in the team slot. So I wanted to build around that uh, trio. And then I think in order to fit that trio and still play more high floor players, which are good for head to head, um, I like Kremp as captain. I mentioned it during the podcast, but I think Kremp captain here uh, for only 9.3K in the captain slot is like pretty high floor, some decent ceiling. Uh, obviously, in a, an underdog matchup against New York, I think he can still get enough points to be worth it. And by paying 9.3K for Kremp in the captain slot, that lets me pay up for Hydra. Um, and then I finish out the lineup with Draza. Um, I think Envoy, who's the most expensive 100T player, has been a little bit of a wild card for me. So I just like some lower cost exposure to 100T and Draza with still huge potential upside and like decent floor because they're playing London. So that's my lineup. Kremp Captain, Scrappy Kleenex, Draza Hydra, and then Toronto as the team slot.